Buddhism, it's not a belief-based religion, it's a practice. There are practices to do to see what you discover. When Buddha gave teachings, he had different people approaching him, and they had different questions, they had different issues. All, all the teachings are important. And no matter where you are, you know, you never are looking down at the teachings if you have a real understanding of them. It's what is the essence of um, what wakes us up and frees us from just ordinary life, but allows us to be in ordinary life as people who are free, not to leave it. You're right in the middle of everything with some freedom. And that's inspiring, and we have something to offer. You know, his deathbed, the Buddha said, don't believe anything I've told you. He said, do what I've asked you to do and see what you find out. I saw this, there was a brochure, and I was trying to decide what to do for the week. I was just going to hang out, go to the spa, you know, whatever. And um, I thought, well, maybe I'll take a class. There were other classes being offered. My husband was teaching songwriting. And so there was this class called Dream Yoga. And I was like, well, that might be kind of fun. Let's see. Do I want to get my nails done, or do I want to do Dream Yoga, or what? You know, it was kind of like that. And then I saw this Lama who was teaching the Dream Yoga class, Lama Tartan Rinpoche, and he really grabbed me. Just looking at him was, I was like, that guy is interesting. And we saw him at breakfast. He was, he was um, eating breakfast in the faculty lounge, and I was there with, with Jimmy, and um, he was just so, sweet and so present and so, I don't know, I can't really even describe it, but I decided to take the Dream Yoga class. And that was in 97, so after that I, after the first three hours of the Dream Yoga class, I figured out that I was hooked on Buddhism and I was going to be a Buddhist practitioner. So, and I even, it was, it was such an emotional experience. I remember going like up to Lama Tartan at this class and and just being in his presence was so overwhelming for me and and I actually <laughs> actually started crying. I went up to him and I was and all he had taught was just, you know, just the four noble truths basically. And and I went up to him and I was and I said so what should I do? Should I go into a monastery or something? You know, should I become a nun? I don't know. And I'm, I'm told, what do you tell me what to do? And he started laughing and he said, you're fine. You know, you're going to, you'll learn more about Buddhism outside of a monastery. <laughs> and so that's, that's how it started. Buddha teaching is not the religion. Buddha teaching is a practice, we have to practice in daily life. So we are helping the people how to live in daily life according to the Dhamma. That's why anywhere we have to, uh, we should help people how to live according to the Buddha teaching. So we are also, we are helping the people like that. My name is Ashin Ariyadama. So this is a Pali wax, the mini of Ashen is a prefix name for all monks. Ariya Dhamma means noble, Dhamma, Dhamma means the teaching of the Lord Buddha. So our Vihara name is called Siddhagu Buddhist Vihara. Siddhagu means the moon, moon. So we have a Siddhagu Missionary Association in Burma. So the founder of that association is my teacher. Uh, Dr. Ashinya Nisra. So that City Group Buddhist we are in Austin, Texas is one of uh, his projects. Austin is like uh, like Bama. In our we our main center in Bama is called Zagai Hill. Zagai Hill is a, like that hill region and many trees and rivers like that. Austin also river, trees and hill. Also the, the weather also very similar to the guy.
in Burma. So there's a one Baba for Seattle Jews here. Also the one Baba is, this is the center of the all uh, location. Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Amarillo, like that. These people can come here. Now they, they are five countries are called Tejawara Buddhist country. Burma, now in officially named Myanmar, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Cambodia and Laos. These five countries are fully in Tejawara Buddhist country. Also Tejawara teaching is spreading all over the world in the United States also. After Buddha demise, after three months, after three months demise of the Buddha, the 500 monks gather together and they decide not to change any teaching of the Lord Buddha, not to put any new teaching of the, to the Lord Buddha. So they maintain the teaching of the Lord Buddha as it was. That teaching was carried by generation by generation till now. That is called Tirawara. Tirawara means origin teaching. We won't correct. So that is the what is called the main concepts of the Tirawara. We won't change. We won't put new one. We we won't take off the from the origin teaching. We maintain as it was only. Um, but we can see in Tirawara teaching, especially in Burma, uh, the highest practice, which is called Vipassana, inside meditation is very developed. It cannot, you cannot find such a uh, teaching, another religion or another sex, only in Tirawara Buddhism. Through the practice of meditation and you know the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, right view, right livelihood, right meditation, right speech, to, karm to purify one's own karma. And through that, attain liberation. Uh, the whole idea of Buddhism for everybody, no matter what vehicle, is to attain liberation from suffering and to attain liberation from one's own, own ego, which is generally considered to be the cause of suffering. What Putta uh, Nana Chas of Austin, uh, the Buddhist temple for all nationality. Uh, my name uh, is Mon Mon Tewa. Mon Tewa. Uh, My name is uh, Pramaha Chaya Lakthong. I am a secretary here. Doi Pukati Baba Konti Jama Fuk Meditation Fuk Lai. เอ่อเราเราไม่มีสเกจชั่นฝึกอะไรเอ่อเราเราไม่มีสเกจชั่นที่ตายตัวคือถ้ามีคนที่มีกลุ่มมีอะไรมาขอร้องขอให้เราส
สอนเขาบางคนก็คือมาแล้วเขาจะไม่รู้เรื่องอะไรเลยเป็นพระคือเป็นอย่างนี้ตามตามพื้นของวัฒนธรรมชาวไทยคนไทยทุกคนคนพุทธไม่ได้เราหมายถึงว่าวัฒนธรรมก่อนอคนไทยสั่งสอนลูกหลานมาว่าเมื่อเกิดมาอยู่ในเมืองไทยเรานับถือศาสนาพุทธเป็นเด็กผู้ชายโดยส่วนมากเน้นเป็นเด็กผู้ชายถ้าเกิดมาแล้วได้บวชได้ศึกษาตามคําสอนของพระพุทธเจ้าได้ปฏิบัติตามเขาเรียกว่ามันเป็นบุญมากเพราะฉะนั้นเด็กทุกคนผู้ชายทุกคนในที่เป็นพุทธในเมืองไทยถ้าเขาโตขึ้นมาถ้าเกิดอะไรมาทุกคนอยากจะบวชทุกคนอยากจะศึกษาเพราะคิดว่าถ้าเราบวชเราศึกษามาเราจะได้เราจะได้เห็นอะไรหลายๆอย่างและจะได้รู้อะไรหลายๆอย่างจากต่างจากชีวิตธรรมดาใช่ไหมส่วนมากคนที่อเมริกันคนที่คนที่นี่จะไม่มีเวลามาเพื่อ,เ,อ,เ,อเรียนการปฏิบัติธรรมเรียนการทําสมาธิภาวนาแต่ว่ากิจวัตรของพระสงฆ์แล้วเราทําอยู่เป็นประจําแต่ว่าถ้ามีกรุ๊ปมีกลุ่มมาเพื่อจะให้เราสอนเ,อเรื่องเกี่ยวกับพุทธศาสนาก็ดีเรื่องเกี่ยวกับการเมดิเตชันการทําสมาธิภาวนาก็ดีเราก็ให้สวิตบริการกลุ่มต่างๆที่เขามีความประสงค์จะมาแต่ช่วงนี้เราจะ <coughs> ามีปัญหาเรื่องเกี่ยวกับการโต้ตอบภาษาอะไรเรายังคนที่เก่งทางด้านนี้ที่เป็นพระสงฆ์ยังไม่มีเ,เวลาจะมีกลุ่มต่างๆเขาติดต่อเข้ามาเราก็จะติดต่อหาคนที่จะมาแปลให้ <coughs> ส่วนมากคนคนไทยพุทธที่นี่หรือว่าคนลาวคนอื่นส่วนมากจะรู้จักพื้นพื้นของศาสนาที่จะเจาะลึกที่จะเรียนศัพท์ลึกๆที่จะนําไปปฏิบัติมันเขาไม่ค่อยมีเวลากันแต่แต่โดยส่วนมากคนไทยที่อยู่ที่นี่เขาไม่รู้เขาไม่รู้จักศัพท์ทางพุทธศาสนาเลือกซึ่งเท่าไหร่ก็ต้องยากพอสมควรเทราวาดายูสพาวเลียนคริสแต่ทางเทราวาดเทราวาดนี่จะมีเฉพาะฝ่ายเทราวาดถ้าฝ่ายมหายานจะเป็นภาษาสันสกฤตอินคอร์ปอเรตส์ที่ไอเดียที่เราไม่ใช่แค่ประสบความสำเร็จในชีวิตของเราเองแต่เราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเองให้กับคนที่เราเจอแล้วเราแสดงความสำเร็จของเราเอง Just achieving enlightenment for myself, but but for all, because there's also the idea that there is no separation between myself and you. There's just basically we're all in this together. And the Mahayana view is. Really insistent that compassion for others is part of the path. And we're trying to see through with some intelligence. Oh, this causes suffering. This causes suffering for me. It causes suffering for other people. Oh, that's how they get started. So it's through that um, misunderstanding. It's just like a Ante uh, Shanti talks about this as an innocent mistake. And so there isn't any moral judgment associated with it. It's not like it's bad to be attached to material things, or it's you know, it's just recognizing that will be the source of suffering. That will be the source of your suffering and suffering for other people. My name is Peg Syverson, and I'm the leader of the Ordinary Mind Group. And I also am a priest with the Austin Zen Center. Well, the group had a kind of a funny beginning because I had been bringing my son to the Unitarian Youth Group out at Live Oak Unitarian Church, and he was enjoying the group very much. And I would stay for services, and it was a very new, young congregation, and so they were asking members of the congregation to give talks. They couldn't afford a minister yet, 
And so they, and they came to me and they asked me if I would give a talk on the internet because they knew I was teaching at UT in computer network classrooms. And I thought about it and I thought, that doesn't seem very appropriate to me. What if I gave a talk about Joko Beck's book, Everyday Zen, because Joko Beck is, is my teacher? And they said, oh, that would be fine. So I gave a little talk about Everyday Zen and I introduced a little bit of meditation practice to the congregation so they could feel what that feels like for about five minutes. And then some folks came up and asked me if I would start a sitting group um, out of that congregation. And I explained to them, I'm not a Zen teacher and you need to work with a Zen teacher, but I would be happy to ring bells and facilitate just the holding the space. And that's really how we began. This temple and this practice is in the Soto tradition. And you probably know that there are two reasonably distinct versions of Buddhism that are uh, that come from Japan, Rinzai and Soto. And the Rinzai tradition, uh, we sometimes practice with uh, Roko Osho from Syracuse Zen Center, and that's in the Rinzai tradition. And that practice is uh, very vigorous, very uh, strong kind of determined practice, very vigorous chanting, and Soto practice tends to be uh, more, a little bit more, uh, I'd say, calm approach to practice, a slower kind of process where there isn't striving built into it, there isn't an energetic, muscular kind of striving, but more uh, emphasis on awareness. Rinzai tends to put a little more emphasis on koan practice, which is the study of teaching stories that are intended to uh, provoke or uh, promote breakthroughs or sudden understanding. So Tozen is a more gradual kind of a practice which doesn't tend to use koans as the center of practice, although they're often used as just general teaching stories. Uh, I think Joko likes to honor both the Soto and Rinzai traditions through the practice of sitting facing the wall um, and then facing the center, uh, slow kinhin and then fast kinhin, and that way is they're sort of married. For the most part, both parts of the tradition have, especially more recently, been learning a great deal from each other and involved in each other's practices quite a bit and have adopted practices um, that are common to each, each of the, each other. So I think that distinction is less severe now, although there's a tradition that comes from the lineage. So for some people who are a little bit um, put off by the formality of the Japanese forms or the strangeness of them, the chanting in Japanese or the many bows and so forth, um, the ordinary mind group is feels more um, comfortable for them or feels they feel more resonance with that. And then sometimes we have people who sit with us for quite a while and also sit with uh, Austin Zen Center because they enjoy learning the embodiment of the forms. The drum that we use is not obviously a Japanese or Asian drum, it's an American Indian drum. It's a good thing to have in Texas, in a temple. Once when asked what is Zen, Suzuki Roshi said, when any religion goes beyond itself, including Zen. Um, and the drum, we don't use very often here because we're not highly formal, despite what you see. Uh, but it's often used either as a timer in the morning before Zazen. It's as if the, the soft kind of sound, just like a heartbeat, every 40 seconds for several, for 15 minutes, begins to count people down as they sit and settle into Zazen. Uh, as a psychologist, I worked for a number of years with people who were dying, especially cancer patients, uh, especially in medical psychology. Two, two things happened. I could see the importance and usefulness and efficacy of psychology and psychotherapy in helping people who were facing uh, severe medical illnesses and life and death issues. Um, but I began to also notice that there was a, a limit to what psychology could offer and that people were asking me questions and also experiencing things that were beyond 
They were transpersonal, they weren't just personal. They were beyond psychology studies. So I was curious about how to help people uh, further. And as I also began to reach my middle age and my own struggles, I wanted a spiritual path that was resonant for me. And I, I didn't really find it in the fully in the Christian framework in which I was raised. That still had some importance to me, but it didn't seem to quite touch the depth that I was looking for, in the way I experienced it anyway from my childhood. So I began to seek, uh, just like a lot of us do, and I'm sure Peg is like this because we're both um, the kind of students they went and got PhDs, you know, we're academically oriented, we studied and read, and but that doesn't really get you to practice. That's, that's just academic intellectual stuff. But it became an incumbent to enter it a little more deeply. So I began to look for a place to practice and found the San Francisco Zen Center to be a place I felt comfortable and a teacher that I really resonated with. And so since this is in essence a subtemple of San Francisco Zen Center in the Soto tradition, which was begun by Shunru Suzuki Roshi, his picture is on this altar. <clears throat> As I was practicing, uh, I had a, a friend who wanted to learn to sit Zazen and he asked if I would help him out. I said, sure, let's, let's sit regularly. Let's, uh, Thursday morning is at 7.30 in my office, how about that? And so we got together. And then somebody else heard about it and they said, can we sit with you? And we said, sure. And then another person and another person. And so without a, an intention really to start anything particular, just by sitting zazen, uh, people began to arrive. In the morning, this is the very first altar that's opened. And um, we offer incense and do bows in reverence to the teacher that brought us this practice. Uh, in many temples in uh, Japan and China, the Kaisando is actually a separate building. It's an entire, in a, in a monastery complex, it would be an entire building. The temple is named after one of the disciples in his lineage, who was my original ordination teacher and Dharma transmission teacher for Barbara Kong, our senior teacher. Uh, and her name is um, Zenkei Blanche Hartman. This temple is actually named Zenkeji, uh, or Inconceivable Joy Temple, and that is the Dharma name for Zenkei Roshi, or Blanche Hartman, is Inconceivable Joy. My decision was to enter a path that had a long and stable history, that had proven itself over many, 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 many centuries. So I wasn't tapping into some um, some current fad or uh, a new age amalgam of things, something that had some real depth to it. Knowing that those um, traditions that had a lot of depth weren't American, and that eventually it would have to become American, that it would be poured into this vessel. The Vajrayana view takes the approach that our obstacles are part of the path. So basically the Vajrayana view takes the approach that everything is part of the path. Whether it's our so-called negative qualities, our more enlightened qualities, um, our anger for instance, that that can be a stepping stone to enlightenment. And in fact, I've even heard it said that the more obstacles you have, the greater your chance for enlightenment once you're on this path. Because the intensity of that negative quality can be an impetus for your enlightenment. So the Vajrayana approach brings in all of the visualizations and, and deity practices and um, uses these things for us to achieve enlightenment and some can some say that, that it's also the quick quicker path where you can achieve enlightenment in perhaps one lifetime. And it's also a slightly riskier path because it's easy to get distracted and misunderstand what the teachings really are. And that's another reason why it's said that especially with the Vajrayana path, 
it's important to have a spiritual guide that has is able to guide you and who's kind of been there already so that you're not likely to go off on a tangent and never come back. is the Dzogchen Austin Sitting Group. Well, Dzogchen, the word, means natural great perfection. The large organization is the Dzogchen Foundation for the teachings of Lama Suridas. As a practice, my understanding of what it means is that it's already there and it's just a matter of being with it. My name is Linda McCarley. I'm Ron Goldman. Denise Montana. Lama Surya received transmission from Nosho Kempo to begin teaching Zochen and specifically to come back to the United States and begin teaching here. His uh, given name is Jeffrey Miller. And uh, he likes to say that his he was raised in a Jewish family, and he likes to say that his mother calls him the Delhi Lama. <laughs> what well, we have are a lot of regional sitting groups like this around the states where they have regular sittings. We don't have any main meditation centers or buildings. Our four annual retreats are held in two in Garrison, New York at the Garrison Institute and two in California. We rent out different facilities. Mm -hmm. And we have a hermitage here in Austin, Texas out in Spicewood, which is a really small retreat center, not for really for public retreat. It's our, it's Nosho Kempo's seat in the West and uh, we've been just getting involved in that lately, developing a little bit. We're basically in these groups not instructing very much, we're just doing being, sitting. Some people may do some shine, some different people in the room may mm -hmm. be doing different things, but we're basically sitting. Lama Surya Das teaches natural meditation, just sitting, just breathing, just being. So that gives you some idea of what the practice is like. One of the things that struck me when I connected with Surya was that I thought he really simplified it. I thought he was uh, able to introduce a lot of different things with, in English with less Tibetan terminology. I was more interested in the, in the core of the practice anyhow. But I thought that that was one of his gifts. I think one of the great things now also is we're, we're really lucky that we have so many Western teachers translating so many of the texts and the misinterpreted Buddhist stuff. I mean, in the 50s and 60s, a lot of the books seemed to have been written by academics and they were not really understandable, they were difficult. Tibetan Buddhism is a lot of guru yoga and devotion. It's hard to walk the whole path without some teacher guidance. I think it might be difficult for people to get a grasp of the Dzogchen right away, but it creeps up on you. Tibetan Buddhism, it, it has little to do with Tibet or Tibetans um, or Asia. It is an inner experience. Um, and it's a method, and these are just the group of people who've carried those teachings, who've preserved the lineage and brought it to us. I'm Bonnie Baptist, and I, uh, I'm the head of, well, not really the head, I'm the spiritual coordinator of Land of Compassion Wisdom, which is an FPMT group. Um, it's inspired by Lama Zopa Rinpoche. And I also have another group, Lone Star Diamonds, which is inspired by Geshe Michael Roach, another Galupa teacher. The primary difference between the two groups, they're both Galupa groups, so both of them are um, based on the teachings of Lama Tsongkhapa. And, um, and essentially we're studying the, the same text. The difference is really in the lamas and the lama style. You know, for me, I have these two lamas and they both are very inspiring. I, I, mean, I think that's the greatest thing that I have to offer anybody is my lamas, you know. Like that's what I want to do is like just bring people to my lamas or bring my lamas to people. Um, and Lama Zopa Rinpoche is just incredible and over the top and we really have to grow to be able to support like a visit with him because, you know, if we build it, they will come. Um, in the FPMT group, I don't present myself as a teacher. 
It's more facilitator, coordinator, friend, Dharma friend. And what we usually do is kind of go around, read a little bit, have a discussion, have some meditation. Um, the ACI course and the ACI group evolved a little bit differently. In that group, we're going through 18 courses, which um, are meant to mirror the Geshe program in uh, Tibetan Buddhist monastery. Geshe Michael was the first American to um, complete a Geshe degree. A Geshe degree um, pretty much amounts to about 20 years of study in a Tibetan Buddhist monastery. And they go through all of the great books, um, serious, rigorous study and debate. It's the equivalent of maybe a doctorate degree in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, however, it takes usually about 20 years of study, so a little bit more comprehensive maybe than a doctorate. Um, but if you know how the Tibetan monasteries are, often little monks go in you know, when they're children, so maybe it's not so different than traditional education. And so now Geshe Mako's manifesting a little bit differently. Well, I'll say that prior to attending his courses, I'd gotten a smattering of teachings, and all of them resonated, and all of them made sense. The beauty of this is it's just really the way that Westerners think, presenting all of that information in a way that we can digest and kind of move forward and progress. So his courses, in my mind, create a context for Buddhist practice um, in a way that I haven't run into any kind of materials or study programs like that before. Um, and so what I had been doing is sending people to the web and saying, listen, there's these great online courses with the homeworks and you know, the audio, everything. But the reality is people, that doesn't, people don't connect with that always. And even though it's like from the Lama's lips, holy lips, um, and it's preferred, uh, he indicated that it would be better for me to go ahead and teach. So I sort of reluctantly um, took that on, but I'm loving it. I listen to Geshe's audio to refresh and go over the readings again. Um, and what I kind of bring to the table is just a, l a little more exposure and experience, a little more context. But the courses have been created you know, for us. And like I said, it's along the lines of the Geshe program, only a lot shorter. All, all the teachings are important. And no matter where you are, you, know, you never are looking down at the teachings, any of the teachings, if you have a real understanding of them. So. Um, I have this story that I went to, a friend of mine was like, there's this Lama, Lama we didn't know, this is in San Jose, and he's gonna be at this Chinese temple. So we show up at the Chinese temple, and I'd never been there before, and we sit down, and they've got like these Buddhas with these glowing lights around him, and the Lama, it's gonna be a chin raising initiation, and he's like, okay, we'll you know, quiet down and do meditation, and they start playing music, this I'm like, oh my gosh, I've never, you know, experienced this. Somebody's eating pork rinds in the back. You know, when we're supposed to like go and cleanse our mouth with saffron water, they're smoking cigarettes, you know, taking a smoke break. And I'm sort of like, wow, man, they don't know what they're doing. You know, <laughs> it's like in this Chinese temple. And, and then I realized, you know, I caught myself like I'm, I'm judging them like I've got it spiritually somehow. And, you know, I realized like, you never know where you are on the karmic chain, you know? <laughs> and just because it looks like I kind of know something now, no, if, I, you know, if I'm not practicing, if I'm sitting in an initiation and I'm judging someone for eating pork rinds, I might not have the good fortune to even get the Buddhist imprint in my next life that they have, you know? The fasts approach, if you really want to get how things, to get to seeing how things are, you, you have to change the mind you know, then everything, you know, just in its suchness becomes something completely different. The lineage uh, that we are is the Karmakaju lineage of Tibetan Buddhism. What is something characteristic of our lineage is that uh, we were never ever uh, throughout the history uh, in India or Tibet uh, much about uh, big organizations <laughs> and and these uh, political structures and stuff. We always have been a lineage of the kind of wild types in the mountains and meditating in caves, you know, for years and things like that. And of course, we don't. We, we're normal here, you could say, in, in our society now. But but you know, the essential thing is that uh, we still try to have the same uh, view and attitude about the practice. Um, you know, if we wouldn't be very good example or it wouldn't be very productive for, you know, our cultures, you know, to really get anything useful if we just all left <laughs> and try to go find some rock, you know, to crawl under and, you know, meditate forever, you know. <clears throat> of course, for some of us, it's, it would be a joyful thing. 
in 2002 in March, I was getting ready to go to Siberia and uh, Russia uh, to uh, travel with Lama Ole uh, through um, all the various centers and retreat centers. And just before I left, uh, that was when Lama Ola asked me to, to, you know, in my free time or, you know, in the time that I have available to visit the other centers and, and uh, begin, you know, just uh, supporting the centers and teaching, you know, from the, the teachings that, uh, that we draw from. The style of the teachings, the point of the teachings, they, they point directly to the mind. They're very direct and it's not really something that is easy. Um, it's not easy, really. And, and there's a lot of power involved. I mean, and what I mean by that is that the, the, um, the inner development, the inner workings of the mind to get really activated when you start working with the meditations and the methods and the teachings. And so it's really necessary in our lineage to have uh, like a main teacher. Uh, our main teacher, Lama Ole, our root teacher, is a Westerner. He, um, he and his wife actually had encountered uh, the teachings while on their honeymoon in 68 and uh, going to Nepal. And so Lama Ole it was the, the student of the 16th Kramatam. And, um, there, actually, the 16th Kamapa died in Chicago in '81, and uh, but he had given a lot of teachings around America, and it's really amazing because uh, people that aren't even with us, you know, but we meet occasionally. They, when they talk about you know, the times that they saw the 16th Kamapa, it's it's really uh, amazing. And people were really. It's like something was really downloaded or something, you know, because they really had uh, some life-changing impressions happen. But essentially, that's like lineage lama, one that holds the lineage, kind of guides it, is the example. They really have all the teachings uh, that are essential to this transmission lineage and also have the realization. The whole idea is that we want as many people who want some relationship with the Dharma to have that relationship. You know, and if we can provide a way for anybody else in this area to find their particular Dharma path, you know, that's what we're wanting because it's meant so much to us. And so to do that, we want to have the the presentation be as free from clutter as possible. I'm Janet Gilmore. Right now I'm affiliated with the Dharmata Foundation. The Dharmata group in Austin is under the spiritual guidance of Tulkutub Rinpoche and he is a um, fairly young Tibetan Lama. He came here I believe in 91, 92 He's in his late 30s and he's um, in the Nyingma tradition. He's a very good teacher, I think, because he's able to bring all that tradition and all of these incredible practices from Tibet to the Western world and actually present it in a way that's palatable to the Western mind. Tulki Tupton loves to change things. I think it's part of the teaching. So this, starting this week, we're going to sit for 40 minutes, basic shamatha practice. And then um, we'll read the Heart Sutra together. And then we'll do one of two sadhana practices, um, either the, the Shower of Blessings, which is a um, guru deity Padmasambhava type practice, or um, the Vajrayogini practice. Those are the two practices that we alternate between. And then we actually have a tape recording from Tulkutuptan that's like a teaching that's 30 minutes or so that will be played. And we have tea. And um, it's open to anybody who wants to come. And we actually have it at this 
interesting house in in the suburbs that's not somebody's house. It's like an art space. And one of the things that Tulku Tupton said the last time he was here was that you know he commented on the fact that there's a lot of artists and musicians in our group. In Tibet, a, a traditional thing to do to to actually leave your jobs, leave your family, sequester yourself at a retreat center for three years. And since that isn't a, for some people with you know financial needs or families, it's not practical to do that. If you're not able to go to a monastery and study, you can actually study with him. The Dharma Apprenticeship Program, um, it's a program to introduce the fundamentals of, of Buddhism and basically takes the student from the Hinayana to the Mahayana to the Vajrayana practices and um, he, he suggests reading. We talk to him on the phone every three weeks. We commit to actually practice meditation daily and sometimes three times a day. When I talked to him uh, a few weeks ago, he said, you know, congratulations on completing this. And he said, now the real commitment is necessary. <laughs> now you must really begin to learn. So it's like, of course, the whole life, you know, the practice lasts your whole life. And the Dharma apprenticeship program will last my whole life, I'm sure. I don't envision myself as a Dharma teacher. Um, I have very good examples of what Dharma teachers are, and, and they have so many qualities, you know, and I'm acutely aware that I don't have those. The teacher, in their freedom, they, they, you know, they instill like certain information or, you know, comments, or they request a student to do something to, you know, uh, best work with the development of that person. But we're, we're offering this the ordinariness of everyday life, the pieces of it that we encounter moment to moment as we're getting in our car, as we're trying to decide which toothpaste to buy, as we, you know, as we stand in the supermarket thinking, where did this all come from? <laughs> you know, in those um, everyday moments to sort of defamiliarize the familiar and to make familiar that which is unfamiliar so that there's nothing in our experience that isn't available to us and that we aren't available toward. Actually, Buddha teaching is, we can say, only three trainings. Sila, morality, samadhi, concentration, and panya, wisdom. So we are teaching these three. So, you know, getting, getting into the teacher role is mainly just about uh, trying to develop into that responsibility but from the viewpoint of the practice. It's, it seems that this is something that instead of um, working towards like you might a, a degree or something, it's, it's as if you just offer yourself to the practice fully and sometimes you find yourself like we have because we're just kind of prone this way, I think, to leadership roles, you end up serving so that in a way or nation at some point because of your training, because of your leadership, or because of your aspiration, the ordination becomes an acknowledgement of something that's already happened. It's not something that you receive, it's something that you give, it's something that you're offering, and that's acknowledged. You know, there could be so many reasons why uh, a teacher may ask somebody to teach, you know. Um, you, it's probably best not to have so many ideas about it, you know. Um, that's what I would say, but it only happens through the permission of a teacher, you know. And our teacher didn't become a Lama because he said he was a Lama, <laughs> you know. He only became a Lama uh, or like, I mean, there's a meaning to somebody who has a title like that. Uh, I mean, you, you have to have a great mastery of meditation to teach meditation, you have to have a great mastery of, of the result of 
accomplishment. Someone who comes who is a completely dedicated, wholehearted practitioner might be practicing in their own personal practice, almost exactly like I would be practicing or like Peggy would be practicing. There's really no difference in practice. I mean, there are some unique things, I would say, in the teaching process because, um, I mean, there's things that you notice that maybe you, you just can't notice unless you are doing it about how people work with their minds and how they relate to kind of a, a teacher person and how some things are very positive and how some things can be very counterproductive to their development. And so from this basis, you, you know, of course, if you, if you don't do that kind of thing, you won't see it so much uh, because you don't get that feedback in your life. You know, but everybody's not looking at you like that. And I think, I really think it's a gift because through teaching, you know, I have to kind of like, I have to be, um, I have to be completely transparent. Those people who take priest vows are saying, I'm a target. So when you notice that I'm not um, uh, fully embodying the vows that I've taken, I invite you to let me know. I invite you to show me that. And um, it's really wonderful. You know, I think it's, I've only been doing it for a couple of months. But I really think that it's, it's helping me personally to evolve. You know, I'm sitting there talking about these holy ideas with people and um, it's like I'm teaching them, but really what's happening is they're teaching me, you know, and getting the privilege to do that. And, you know, if you believe in karma, I'm, I have a little idea of the causes that I'm creating and it's kind of exciting, so. There's so many things going on and everybody has so much amazing potential, you know. It doesn't mean that at wherever I go, I certainly have like the most knowledge or realization. No, it just, you know. Um, but, you know, I do have the, the blessing and um, request from my teacher to do what I'm doing with the, the best way I can, you know. You know, this Tibetan Buddhism seems to be a little bit complicated. You know, from what I understand in different centers and different teachings, it's just, a little bit difficult for anybody to teach it. You know, you have all your Vajrayana practices, you have your foundation practices, you have so many aspects of it. And I mean, your experience with your teachers, you see how much training they've had and how many years they've spent mm -hmm. in deep practice. It's, um, it's a chore to train teachers, and teachers that get it, and then can... Right, and then can teach it. You know, there's probably a good 150 or more traveling teachers that are you know, uh, students of Lama Ole, and um, you know the the important point is is that all of these individuals um, have ex you know they only do it because they have express you know permission <laughs> you know and they've been asked to do it by by the Lama you know so that basically is you know, how it works with our school, you know, nobody definitely just kind of starts to teach and, you know, self-proclaim things. Because we're not offering this little privileged experience of enlightenment where you go off to the monastery and bang, a bunch of Kensho experiences, you know, that's not what we're offering. Everything is a bit like you try to recognize, like, what it is or what's included because Nothing really changes, actually, because everything is still a practice, you know. You, you don't stop being a practitioner and suddenly just become this principle and you don't have to do anything, you know. Like, here's this holy cow and that's the principle that I am and therefore I don't have to do anything anymore. Mm. Describe the meditations I do at the meetings. That might be also describing the meditations that I do. <laughs> I'm offering a way for people to sit meditation as a way to discover something about themselves. It's, it's nice to have, you know, focus where you can just really dedicate your mind's energy and direction solely on meditation. There's really something special about that. I think people do a variety of different practices uh, associated with the sitting meditation. The fundamental practice is shikantaza or 
just bare awareness. But for many people, that's a pretty difficult task. So there are some practices that, uh, that are helpful and supportive of people's meditation, including following the breath and um, body awareness practices, uh, different kinds of techniques of concentration practices to help steady the mind. Uh, meditation. หลักวิธีการที่อบรมมาที่เรียนมามันจะมีที่ที่นี่ใช้อยู่สองวิธีก็คือหนึ่งวิธีการกำหนดลมหายใจแล้วก็สองวิธีการพิจารณาตามหลักสติปัฏฐานสี่แต่ส่วนมากเราจะคนส่วนมากจะรู้การกำหนดลมหายใจเช่นหายใจออกพุทธหายใจเข้าโทพุทธโท but the primary work that people are doing here comes out of their everyday lives and their encounters with the teacher. So out of the issues that arise in your life, you might be uh, dealing with a lot of anger or you might be dealing with some disturbance in a relationship. And in meeting with the teacher and encounters with the teacher, then there are specific recommendations for students around those issues which are most central for them at the moment and that changes over time so the practice depends a great deal on that relationship with the teacher and no matter what practice we're doing or whether or not you're working with the teacher we always come back to stillness and silence to the sitting in an upright posture that's steady um, that allows us to be relatively quiet and relatively still and cultivate a mind that is open to whatever's happening, uh, which is usually called mindfulness. And sometimes we have to train ourselves a bit in that because our minds is, you know, are a little bit wild. Um, sometimes our people are shocked when they sit down and attempt to be quiet about how wild their mind is. It, it feels a little bit like things get worse before it gets better in the beginning. But it's just an awareness that begins to develop of how that wild our mind can be. So as we settle a bit in our bodies and settle a bit in our minds. We begin to see beyond just the everyday stories that we tell ourselves and the everyday stresses and strains. Those all continue to happen. Um, Buddhist meditation doesn't mean you're exempt from a body and a life and the difficulties of relationships, but it does bring you into a new relationship with it in the ways that Peg was talking about. Uh, we call sitting meditation in Zen Zazen. And Zazen just means sitting meditation. And that's our fundamental practice. No matter what you learn about the tradition, no matter what things you wear, uh, no matter what other practices you may do, it, none, none of it matters if you don't sit often. If you don't sit in stable, upright, silent, still meditation. But that's our core. That's the one thing that's not negotiable in our practice. Just sitting, just breathing, just breathing. Being. There's nothing to do and nothing to not do, and n nothing to be and nothing to. I mean, you know, it's it's the seemingly paradoxical idea, but um, what could be more simple than that, and what could be harder? The fundamental practice is just sitting, and that's the and that's I think where the most benefit is is actually in in sitting and learning to concentrate and focus your mind and quiet your mind and then relax in that state that 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 arises out of that so the the 40 minutes of just sitting is is primary ก็คือว่าวิธีที่สอนง่ายๆคือวิธีอานาปานสติพูดง่ายๆคือว่ากําหนดลมไหมถ้าคุณรู้ว่าคุณหายใจเข้าตอนไหนหายใจออกตอนไหนแล้วก็ใจคุณจดจ่อกับลมใจจดจ่อไม่ต้องคิดเรื่องอื่นถ้าอยู่กับลมหายใจเข้าออกลมมันแสดงว่ามีสติจุดหลักๆทั้งสองวิธีคือให้มีสติอยู่ตลอดเวลานั่นแหละคือการทําสมาธิและก็การทําสมาธิไม่จําเป็นเราต้องมานั่งหลับตาภาวนาทุกที่ทุกสถานเราสามารถทำเมดิเตชันได้ตราบใดที่ยังมีตราบใดที่สติของเราเร็วแล้วก็อยู่กับตัวกับตนเราตลอดนั่นแหละเรียกว่าการทำ
They talk about Dzogchen meditation being the open awareness practice. So that's talked about a lot too. Openness. Let's see how it's Lama Surya says 360 degree global sphere of awareness. And um, so cultivating that kind of sense that it's all perfect, it's all right now. You're not missing anything. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything, like Denise was saying. So, so the FPMT group, um, usually we close out our meetings with a meditation. Um, often it will be on the topic that we've just discussed. Sometimes it's really just a connecting with the guru meditation. Um, another meditation that I like is Tonglen, which is exchanging self and others. So, And that's a really powerful meditation. So when I don't know, these are lead meditations that I do in the FPMT group. So when I don't know what to lead, I'll usually default to Tonglen. It's, it's just incredible. So um, we do about 20 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes of meditation at the end. And I think it's a good way um, to just let the teachings kind of dissolve into us and kind of settle into us. You know, these types of methods, like I said, they really, really activate a lot. Um, we, it's not an approach where you simply learn, say, to calm your mind. That's it's only a, a tiny portion of what you, you have to work with. You know, then you have to, there are other things that involve really trying to clean one's awareness of, of uh, habits of anger and like pride and jealousy and attachment and all these things. The sadhana practices, whether it's the Vajrayogini practice or the Shower of Blessings, is a, it's an advanced Vajrayana practice. And the idea is to invoke and recognize the qualities in ourselves that are enlightened. And the idea in Vajrayana, which took me a long time to really understand, is that by visualizing those qualities in this imagined deity, we're actually able to more quickly realize them in our own selves. And so after that, then and then one flows with the wish that all the good feelings and impressions and clarities and compassions and power, all these things that were known and seen and are felt right there in meditation, that it streams to all beings. You know, one you know, tries to extend all the goodness actually to all beings in one's mind and that it removes their own suffering and causes of suffering and and that they find the real absolute peace and highest joy and, and power by seeing the nature of mind themselves. So this is, this is where the meditation flows into daily life with that feeling so that meditation doesn't feel like, you know, it really ends there and then life is ordinary over here. It, it, we try to bring it into daily life like that on as deep as level as possible until we get to the cushion again. And then, you know, the point being, of course, that at a certain point, you know, there's actually no difference in one's uh, daily life and, and like meditation, pillow life, you could say. It's one's always, always keeping a high level of awareness all the time. Well, I think, I think it's a different um, approach that Americans take. Um, because we weren't raised Buddhist, we have to like, either we're looking to run away from what we know and just be different, which could be good, or, um, or we, we're making effort and finding something new, right? So I think that may be a little bit of an advantage in a practice. I think you see the same thing when you see um, Asians who are Christian, you know, often, I would say often they're like, they have like an energy and a freshness in their approach. You know, it's like, it sounds new to them and it touches them in a different way. There are certain background assumptions in other cultures that we can't take for granted here. So in the Asian cultures where 
within the rows, there's a very strong social network. People are very strongly connected to each other. Uh, that's a background assumption that much of the teachings have to do with awakening to your original mind. And so there, that piece of it that got ported into this country in the beginning was really uh, resonant with our sense of individuality and uh, that American sense of independence. We don't have uh, much of a monastic tradition in the culture. And the monastic version of Buddhism evolved. It's not the core of the primary original teachings either. Um, those were wandering monks and teachers who would gather you know, once a month for a full moon ceremony and for repentance, and then they would scatter and teach. Um, so the monastic model arose really um, in China where uh, the monks, there was no tradition of mendicant begging monks. You know, the Chinese are like, get a, get a job. I mean, they're much like American culture. Like, you want something, work for it. I'm not going to, you know, put things in your begging bowl. So monasteries were developed so that um, monastics could support themselves. That's what, what had to happen. Yeah, here it's a little bit difficult because the situation is different. So we cannot follow all we need our rules here. Suppose in Burma, we used to go for arms round every morning, you know, using the bull, and we go house by house. People offer spawn by spawn. So after many houses we round, we have uh, more than enough food. This is our tradition. Here we cannot do like that. How we can do here, I drive a car, I pick up the food in the evening. <laughs> Well, in the United States, we have a kind of a different tradition, um, a different culture, and a different way of thinking. It's very individualistic, for one thing. <laughs> you know, Americans are very unique in that they're always moving around every place, every state, and work, and school, and all kinds of things. And it's a work, work, work society, much more so than Europe, actually. I mean, you, you hear about the vacations they get over there, and it's very different than what we have here. So the real I think the real gift of, of pr Buddhist practice in the West is to teach Western culture about the significance of Sangha, um, the, the shared aspiration and the synergy in your practice that emerges when you're practicing with other people who have this shared aspiration, where you have actually an explicit, not just permission, but expectation that you'll work together. That, I think, is a great gift, but it's going to express itself a little bit differently than in the conventional, traditional models that we have from Asian nations. So this is being worked out now, and it's being worked out not just here, but everywhere. Um, and all Zen centers, all Buddhist practice places are wrestling with, okay, we have this culture, people have families, they have jobs, they're not going to walk away from those things to join a monastery, much as they may wish they could. Um, because they have commitments and responsibilities, and we want to make it clear that Buddhist practice is well situated in those responsibilities and everyday re, um, kind of activities that people are engaged in. So right where you are is where your practice is. So in the early days of Zen in America, there wasn't as much emphasis put on the role that Sangha plays in supporting practice and supporting the, the work of liberation. That's a piece that I think is very important for us to foster and develop in really situating Zen in a Western culture. We can't have that background assumption that the culture's quite quite connected, that people are quite connected to each other. So much, people from the people who are 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 the people we are interested in the meditation here in Westerners. So the first they came for meditation. After meditation, they are very much impressed in the teaching of the Buddha and other than they learn about the Buddha teaching, other than they go back to the Buddha scripture, other than we can teach the scripture for the test. So first meditation first. Later, so we can say, practice come first, theory come later. Here, in Burma, theory come first, practice come later. Like that. 
Suzuki Roshi, who started the San Francisco Zen Center, came to the United States in 1959, before any of this stuff was really going on here. But he found that Americans were really interested in practicing deeply. And in Japan, regular, everyday folks don't practice. The priests or the monks practice in the monasteries, and the lay people support the priests. That's the Asian way. Uh, but, the, but the lay people don't practice in a way like sitting zazen and doing this. So he found that Americans were interested in that, and that fascinated him. Because actually for him it was new. <laughs> ทุกคนมีหน้าที่เรียนรู้หลักศาสนาให้มันลึกซึ้งหน้าที่ทุกหน้าที่ของแต่ละคนของแต่ละกลุ่มมันก็จะไปรวมกันอยู่ในสังคมรวมกันเมื่อเราอยู่รวมกันแล้วก็หน้าที่แต่ละคน
and incubated for a long, long time all by itself. It became a very powerful, very beautiful kind of lineage. But when it came to the West, it was very quickly uh, recognized that a lot of things just aren't going to function in the West if you try to bring stuff over. In the West, we kind of require a kind of like, um, you know, we like to know what we're doing, <laughs> you know, for one thing. And if you didn't translate certain things, you know, and you were just mumbling Tibetan stuff, you have no idea what you're mumbling, it, it doesn't really help. You know, if you, if you have a lot of things that are just like Tibetan culture things, then you, you wind up with people who are taking refuge in cultural things, rather than taking refuge into the essential point, which is, you know, the enlightened state of mind. This is one's real refuge, which is one's own fundamental ground, you know, of, of, it's their own mind. This is what you want people to be resting in and solid about. That, that's what I'm interested in personally in America, how we can bring that kind of freedom, that kind of liberation, that kind of enlightenment of living to this culture. And, um, and so, you know, it's been a process over, um, you know, these decades to keep, you know, clarifying the, the things that, so that culture is removed. It is not about being Japanese. It's not about being Indian. It's not about being Tibetan. It's not about being a Thai. It has nothing to do with any of those cultures, or it doesn't have anything to do with being American. It has to do with about being awake. When I was living in New York City, I became interested in Buddhism about uh, 15 years ago. And uh, I saw an advertisement uh, from a, a, a Chan Center, Zen Center, Chinese Zen Center, uh, in Elmhurst, which was the place I was living in in New York City. Uh, it's about five blocks away from my house, and the, 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 the teacher there was uh, Chan Master Shen Yen, who's a very famous uh, Chan Master, so I was very fortunate to uh, study with him. And uh, living in New York City, I had access to a lot of really great teachers uh, from the East and also from the West, and, uh, and I've always been interested ever since. Zen, the Japanese word, is actually a translation from Chan. Chan and Zen means the same thing, and they have actually the same Chinese character in Japanese and Chinese. Because Japanese spread the Zen first in the Americas, that's why America is more familiar with Zen rather than Chan. I'm Sky, uh, I'm the president of Buddhist Association, and uh, I'm a graduate student in education and psychology. Uh, my name is Mark, and uh, I'm volunteering today with the, with the UT's Bruce Association, uh, and I often go to the events that they sponsor. Uh, I'm not a student anymore. Uh, I work for myself now as a day trader. Well, basically, Buddhist Association uh, has been established for 20 years for now, and um, we usually organize uh, several Dharma talks throughout the semester at the Texas Union. And uh, we also organize a trip to, uh, to visit the temple or Zen centers around Austin or Houston. What drew me, um, so, since I'm uh, not a student, is uh, the quality of speakers that come here, uh, which I was used to from New York City. Um, so I heard about it and I said, that, you know, I was more interested in hearing them than being part of our, our the UT Bruce Association. Um, so I would hear, they would advertise and I would hear about a speaker and I would go and they're really good and uh, every semester they have two or three really outstanding speakers, and uh, it's very interesting, and um, the students there uh, make me feel very welcome, and they're very friendly. We actually open our, uh, all our activities to the public, including the students, uh, staff, faculty, and as well as those who are not affiliated with UT. We, we do have an emphasis in uh, Zen tradition, uh, which is uh, the Chinese tradition. But we do invite uh, venerables from other traditions to, to our talk. Basically, we invite the masters or the venerables from different organizations of different lineages uh, around Austin and Houston. 
and it is our um, purpose to introduce this organization and various tradition to the students and uh, the public. Usually our public talk is centered around the organizations uh, in Austin or Houston. Sometimes we don't um, initiate the activity by ourselves. Sometimes it is the input from, um, from other bodies around the Austin and we will try to figure out whether we have time to organize it and uh, uh, if we do and if it works out that uh, we can help them to call sponsor that event, then we'll help them to organize it. I'd just like to say that I'm uh, very grateful for the UT Boots Association. Um, I have access to other schools uh, in town where they have highly qualified teachers and also where they sponsor teachers from out of town to come and speak. So I take advantage of that. And But this is just another opportunity for me to meet with uh, very good teachers and also uh, uh, serious practitioners. So um, I'm very uh, fortunate. I feel very fortunate and I'm very grateful. I think one of the you know challenges that Westerners have is this aversion to our own spiritual paths. You know, it's almost like um, the holy things that Christ said. You know, the holy Dharma that Christ taught. We may not have the ears to hear it. You know, because we've just heard it all of our lives. And um, I think that's a challenge. You know, one of the vows actually as a Buddhist is not to. Um, denigrate other spiritual traditions, you know, to have an appreciation for them. I don't have to be able to do it. It's just that everyone is interested in the spiritual practice. It's not that it's Christ, it's not that it's Post, it's not that it's Islam, it's not that it's Hindu. If everyone is interested in the spiritual practice, it's not that it's the spiritual practice, it's not that it's the spiritual practice. And it's not that it's the spiritual practice. It's not that it's the spiritual practice, it's not that it's the spiritual practice. So we have a fair number of people who are, um, some of them will call themselves recovering Christians, <laughs> and some of them are active, but they're active in a contemplative practice. I mean, they can see the tremendous benefits. And as we say, there's nothing secret about what Zen offers. It's an open secret. Uh, but that attention, that continuous awareness, um, is uh, central to both traditions. The aspiration is the same. The frame is different in which it's expressed. The woman whose place we're practicing at, um, her, she doesn't claim Buddhism, but she practices with us. And, um, you know, I think there's several people in that position that are, that love the meditation and love the practice and and they're incorporating it into their other um, spiritual path, whatever that is. You know, Self-inquiry is at the center of the whole thing, not, uh, not belief, which also means that it's not a competitive religion against some other religion. It's not like, well, you can be a Christian or you can be a Buddhist. Some of the senior Buddhist teachers in this country are Catholic priests, fully ordained, still practicing Roman Catholic priests or nuns. Because since it's not theistic, it doesn't repudiate a higher power or God. Um, it doesn't say there's not one. It doesn't say there is one. It's simply not the question. And now, when I when I think about Christian teachings, I have a totally different attitude. I have such a better attitude about all the Christian teachings I was ever exposed to. It's almost like I went through so much of the ritual and just hearing it all the time that it lost its meaning. You know, so I think. Buddhism, it's new for us. It has meaning. It's like, wow, emptiness, what's that? You know, never heard of that before. Give me more. Uh, karma, how cool, you know, it seems to make sense. I was raised Catholic, and so at first, I was kind of um, off-put by the elaborateness of all of it, but I have grown to, as I've learned more, as I've studied and heard and listened and I've grown to, to love it. I really appreciate all of the color and the, the elegance and the, the just the incredible beauty in, in Tibetan iconography. So I would say that's maybe the biggest challenge is getting over um, a lot of hang-ups and uh, 
and issues that people have with our own spiritual traditions. Um, and I speak in a lot of uh, Christian churches around, um, since I was raised in Texas as a Baptist, with my grandfather was a preacher, my uncle, my cousin, and very, very much in a very traditional uh, Texas Baptist family. And so I haven't had that in my bones. That's how I grew up. And uh, I was just telling someone today, one of the most surprising things to me that I didn't anticipate in studying Buddhism and practicing deeply is that then when I turned back and reflected on the Christian teachings that had um, been part of my childhood, I began to look at them with a new eye, in a new way. And my response was, oh, I wish they would have taught it to me that way the first time. You know, I began to have a much deeper appreciation for my Christian background not a turning away. I mean, I know a lot of people have a greater appreciation for, for Christianity now than they ever did before. And I'm sure, you know, I'm very acutely aware when that that could be heretical to a Christian, you know, and I don't want to come off as like some pious know-it-all Buddhist who's like, let me tell you what Christ meant, you know, it isn't like that. Um, but it's like, what does it mean to me? So it has greater meaning for me. I'm asked to speak in lots of Christian settings as sort of a translator uh, between the two, because I kind of speak both languages, and I really enjoy it. It's a, it's a very nourishing thing for me. And I think the Christian traditions are starting to recognize the significance of meditation practices that Zen has always offered. So they're curious, and I think many Christian churches and believers are now increasingly drawn to contemplative practice, centering prayer, uh, various kinds of meditation. So I'm curious about it. And we have people who have come out of sort of new age traditions. And the, the difficulty, I think, with people who have sort of explored all the new age experience, the difficulty for them is that they've come to recognize that the new age experience is about this deep. You know, after you've done work with crystals so far, I mean, yes, you can study crystals forever, but uh, but there isn't much depth there, and Zen has a great depth of tradition in the teachings and the history and the practice of it. The Buddha was only interested in suffering. He wasn't interested in metaphysics. Now, the way in which Buddhism has developed in these different cultures, there are different things that are tied in. But Buddhism is not about whether or not there's a God, what happens after you die, what's the meaning of life. It's about response to suffering. And so there are also some of the very most senior teachers in the United States are practicing Jews. You don't give up one then to become this other thing. It's irrelevant about being a Buddhist. And some people talk about Buddhism as the most psychological of religions or even the most religious psychology because it's a self-inquiry process of working with the mind to see how we create suffering for ourselves and for others and how we can relieve that kind of suffering. ถ้าทุกคนทำตามหลักของศาสนาของตัวเองมันก็จะทำให้โลกของเราสงบมีความสุข I've been practicing for almost 10 years. Um, I was, I will say this, I was not a spiritual seeker. I was not, um, I had a little, uh, it's kind of ironic, I had a little bit of a disdain for people who are spiritual because I thought they just couldn't deal with reality. And um, <laughs> then I had some personal suffering, which is always great for like cracking open the nut, you know, like just recognizing that I'm not any different. The, the first teaching that the Buddha gave was on the truth of suffering. And I was 30 years old before I really got that in my own life not as Buddhist teachings, but just my own experience. I always thought I was smarter, um, more flexible, adaptable, that, you know, I'd suffer, but there was like a real finite amount of suffering that I personally was going to do. And then I fell flat on my butt multiple times and actually found myself um, going through this depression. Even that didn't make me look for something spiritual. So I still wasn't looking for anything spiritual but I had been kind of broken down. So my sense of self and just feeling a little bit more vulnerable. And a friend invited me to meet, um, well, he was going to some teachings of a Tibetan Lama. Rebbe Rinpoche. Um, he had been 
imprisoned in a Chinese um, camp and tortured, and he was Tibetan Lama. And I thought it sounded like interesting, you know. I wasn't seeking, but it sounded interesting. And I went and I almost embarrassed to say, I, the first night, I just walked out and I thought, I'm a Buddhist. I don't really know what that means. I don't know what that entails. But that guy, you know, everything he said felt like everything I felt and ever thought. And he was incredible. And like the Americans, a after the teaching, you know, nobody interrupted the teachings, but afterwards it was question and answer time. And all the questions were about the prison camp, you know, what was the torture like and how bad was it? You know, this is where our minds are, you know, it's almost like, I don't know, one of those programs we want to get like the dirt, like what was it like? And he just said that they were his greatest teachers. And His Holiness often tells a story about um, a monk who was in a Chinese prison camp and he was talking to the monk and the monk said, you know, one time I was really in danger. And His Holiness asked him, you know, he thought, well, what happened? And he said, yeah, one time I almost lost my patience. One time I almost lost my compassion. And uh, I don't know if that was Reba Rinpoche <laughs> who had that exchange with His Holiness, but uh, it really would not surprise me. That, that was the way he was manifesting, and he meant it, you know. It wasn't like just saying it because it sounds good or holy. It was like he meant they were his teachers. So I like to think that that story was about Reba Rinpoche. I don't know for sure. Um, maybe, you know, that's the beautiful thing. That kind of attitude isn't so uncommon among the lamas. May my mind turn to others. May I nothing just of myself. May my mind. May I nothing just of myself But when I do May I harm my heart in tenderness But when I do May I harm my heart with both hands Just like I hope to hold May my mind turn to others May I nothing just of myself May my mind turn to others May I nothing just of myself But when I do
as, as Joko said, well, uh, it's been around for 2,500 years, 